So, um, welcome to our next, next section, um, which is more or less an uh, in-depth analysis of uh, resampling procedures. So we really want to understand why resampling is a better estimator than hold out. And we'll address that by um, again doing a bias variance analysis. And I'll again do this through um, a continued um, empirical example that we already began for hold out. So remember, we studied um, the bias and the variance for hold out as an estimator. Um, depending on its split rate, so whether we would be using, I don't know, a third or 50% or two thirds for training and the rest for testing. And then we saw that kind of, yeah, there was this bias variance trade off going on and we figured out that it's probably not a too bad rule of thumb if we would be using two thirds for training and about one third for testing. And we'll redo that for um, resampling now. I'll use subsampling as a simple example case. And uh, we will basically figure out that the variance is strongly reduced for subsampling um, as an estimator, as a resampling estimator of generalization error um, because of the, well, repetitions going on in subsampling. And that allows us also to uh, make training sets larger to also um, in parallel or um, you know, um, additionally drive down the pessimistic bias of subsampling. We'll also um, take a look at this uh, theoretically and then um, yeah, kind of wrap up with a complicated discussion of why in general these uh, samples are, that are produced during cross-validation and, and during resampling in general are not as, as independent as we would like them to be, which really creates problems in uh, confidence interval estimation and um, null hypothesis significance testing which we might want to put top, on top of cross-validation and subsampling. And uh, I'll, I'll finish with a short guideline for practical use. Okay, so let's start with our empirical analysis of bias variance for, uh, for resampling estimators. So we did that for holdout. So we took a pretty um, yeah, lengthy look at um, an experiment where we um, yeah, ran a machine learning algorithm. I think if I remember this correctly, maybe you should also reread this again. Um, reread the setup again, um, which is, um, yeah, I don't know, a little bit, little bit um, technical and, and well, I don't want to say difficult, but you, you need to you need to remember the details to understand the analysis. So we were using, I think, the spirals data set we were using. Uh, that doesn't really matter. Here we were using um, uh, a simple machine learning algorithm. I think that was a card decision tree. That also doesn't really matter here. What mattered a lot was that we were splitting up. Um, a data set with 500 observations into various training and uh, test sets with different split rates. And the split rates you can see here on the x axis. And we were measuring the, well, probably I should say MC hat here. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe like that. We are measuring the estimated misclassification error through this resampling based estimator. And we took a look at how this uh, looked like for, for holdout here. And we were seeing that what happened was that the larger we made um, the split rate, so the more observations we used in training, the smaller our pessimistic bias became. So around here, um, it became um, close to zero. So again, this, this black line here is the true, um, true generalization error that we also simulated in this example and could, could therefore calculate. So this is a little bit more than, I think, 10 or 11 percentage points. So our box plots should actually, for a, for a well-behaved estimator, they should be nicely centered around this uh, black line. And we can't exactly probably ex kind of expect that or assume that this is going to happen because of this pessimistic bias, which will all, always be there in, um, in resampling. But we're getting very, very, we're getting fairly close to it for holdout yeah, somewhere after um, about um, 65, 70% for as a split rate used for training examples. And then after that, beyond that point, the variance goes up uh, because our test sets become so tiny and so small. Now, what you can already see here, so the, the second uh, box plots, uh, these, these greenish guys here are the ones from subsampling. So of course, I mean, first of all, I'm um, yeah, measuring them for the same split rates as for holdout and then comparing them. And um, I'm using here subsampling with uh, 50 iterations. Uh, so um, and in general, I'm replicating every estimator, so the holdout estimator and the subsampling estimator uh, 50 times. Um, so in order, these 50 replications are therefore to produce the box plots. What you can already see is that, that this should not come as a large surprise, or both, both things that I'm going to say should not come as a large surprise, is that the uh, bias of subsampling is basically, the pessimistic bias is basically the same as for holdout because we are well, using the same split rates and uh, 
pessimistic bias basically depends on the split rate and that we're using less less than n points for training. Um, and you can also see that the variance is much smaller, which also shouldn't come as a surprise because we are doing exactly the same in subsampling as in holdout, but doing it multiple times and then averaging over it and that drives down drives down variance. And if we are lucky, this would drive down variance um, yeah, with a factor of uh, one divided by 50. And we'll discuss a little bit, especially discuss this more in, in context of proselytization that it's not as easy as that. But um, yeah, um, that, that at least that would be the, that would be the ideal. Yeah? And the, I, that's the idea behind the whole thing. And we are nearly getting that, but we're not getting it exactly. So um, yeah, as I said, we compare both estimators now to this real misclassification error, which is the black line. We can see that yeah, well, I guess I'm repeating myself now that the pessimistic bias for holder for given S is the same. We see much less variance. Um, and the next thing to do would again, um, would be to again study the uh, MSE of our estimator. Yeah? So the MSE of our resampling estimator of generalization error. So not the MSE of any regression algorithm. We're not even using that here, We're doing classification. And we did that for holdout. That, that's this curve here. And we figured out that kind of the optimal point, yeah, so the, I mean, the estimator with the lowest MSE, yeah, so our split rate with the lowest MSE, that should probably be the thing we should consider in practice. Uh, if we would do a real scientific study with many more data sets than just, just one here. Um, so that would be around here. Now, the next thing we can see that because of um, variance reduction going on in subsampling, the subsampling estimator completely dominates the holdout estimator. So it's better um, on each and every point in this plot here. So it's, I mean, of course, it's more expensive, but in terms of its statistical properties, it's um, better for any split rate. And it's certainly better, and I guess that's the most relevant point, it's uh, better in terms of its optimal point. Uh, so if we compare these two guys here. Um, so first of all, um, the MSE of, the, of this specific estimator for, for subsampling is much better than the MSE of this point here. The next thing we can see is that also apparently our rule of uh, thumb for the split rate has changed. And um, because the variance of subsampling is much smaller because of these repetitions and we see more test data because we are repeating holdout splits uh, and then we are seeing more test data in, yeah, in these replications, this enables us to actually push the boundary for um, our um, split rate for training data much further to the right hand side. So for each individual split, we are seeing less test data but in general, that's not so bad because we are repeating that stochastic process yeah, and we'll see other smaller test sets and at the end average over all of them. So in this specific example here, the optimal split rate is somewhere between, I don't know, 0.8 and 0.85. You can also see that um, it goes up a little bit here uh, at the end. And this is somewhat surprising, right? Because how I have um, argued um, about now, um, we should actually be able to push through more and more repetitions um, this the, the placement here of the optimal point more and more to the right hand side until we are basically ending up with leave one out cross validation. But this is actually not what happens. Um, because this would only then happen if um, yeah, we would be averaging out over independent samples. But unfortunately, we are not averaging over independent stuff. And this is what I want to discuss more on the next slides. Unfortunately, this is a bit more complicated. But I've already warned against yeah, going um, to the extreme of, of leave one out and so on in practice. So this, you can kind of, you can kind of also see this, this uh, slide going up here as a further empirical proof of um, my claim before that you should leave out a few examples um, in testing, but not only one. Okay, so um, that was the empirical analysis. I now also want to do a theoretical analysis so we can um, see um, that this theoretical analysis is, is in line and matches what we have seen before. My goal is to do this theoretical analysis for theoretical discussion. Yeah? Let's put it like that. So I'm not going uh, into super many details. I want to do this for resampling based estimators. But before we do this, maybe as a, I don't know, as a, a simple practice, as a simple exercise, let's do this for the dedicated test set scenario. So what was the dedicated test set scenario? So we have our uh, data set D and we can use that in its entirety for training our model F hat. Yeah, this, so this guy here. And then there's a dedicated test set and we have no inclination to also train our model on that test set for some weird reason. Uh, let, maybe let's say this is a Gedanken experiment, uh, so a thought experiment. And um, for some reason, we can really use that just for testing purposes. Our goal is to estimate the generalization error of our model f hat 
which is nothing more than the expected loss of our model when used on a random test sample xy. So this is exactly how we defined this guy here before. Now we'll use our dedicated test set uh, generalization error estimator GE hat, which is also fairly simple. So this just means using our model f hat, running it over the test set, um, predicting on each observation, measuring the loss, and then averaging everything. Um, and I want to study now how well this estimator here, this guy approximates this guy. And yeah, yeah, technical side comment, only the x and y's are random. So these are random variables, but our model f hat, we're basically conditioning on that. Yeah, that's fixed. So this is now really simple because if x and y, so these are MIID fresh test samples from our independent test set. So if that's the case, then all of these guys here, yeah, I don't know, I could call them, I don't know, li or whatever, yeah, um, they are all because x and y are IID random variables or x, x comma y is an IID vector. These li loss values here, they will also be IID, MIID um, random variables. So their expectation and their variance will be the same for all li. Furthermore, um, because this is a rather large averaging sum over many LIs. So maybe th this is over a hundred or maybe this is over a thousand. We know that we can approximate the distribution of this average construct here through the central limit theorem. So it will roughly um, be a Gaussian, which is centered around the expectation and has a standard deviation or a variance that we can simply compute by computing the expectation of one L or one LI, uh, so that because they're all the same, uh, um, they're all from the same distribution, I can basically drop the index. So I can compute one, one expectation of one L and I compute the variance of one L and that will also will completely define here my Gaussian distribution. And this is exactly what I'm doing now. Um, I'm now computing the expectation of this guy and this is also really simple. We know how this looks like, right? And um, because this is, I mean, we basically can write it down immediately because this is um, an expected value over an IID average. Yeah, so I can write my, my E operator here, I can immediately draw this to the inside, can drop, well, basically this index here. Yeah, so the, these guys will always be the same. And because this is now, this is now a, this, this expectation of this guy now is now a scalar, yeah, a constant number if I compute that. And now I'm averaging over that. Well, so it will completely stay the same, right? So the expectation of this guy here is simply this. So this is the expected loss when we apply our model F hat to a fresh observation X, Y. So this was exactly our definition of our true generalization error of F hat. So what we have now sh shown is that the expectation of this guy here is exactly what we want to estimate. And this is what we would call biased if they are both the same. And excuse me for now trying to write down with this annotation tool. And um, the other thing I can do is I can now compute the variance. And this is equally simply be simple because I can um, drive down my V operator to the inside of that sum. So here I have to be a little bit careful, right? So the variance is, is only a, um, a linear operator that I can drive inside of that sum. Um, my L's are independent, but they are independent here, right? Because the X, X, Y guys are independent. So I can drive that to the inside. Um, yeah, and then I will see this general formula that if I consider the average of something, then variance goes down linearly yeah, with the number of elements in my averaging. So it goes down with a factor of one, one divided by m. So I now know, know this, that this estimator is unbiased. I know that variance decreases linearly in test set size. And I have actually an approximation at my hands of the full distribution. Uh, so I, I can do this Gaussian, Gaussian approximation because of the central limit theorem which enables me to do stuff like a non a null hypothesis significance tests if I want that. I can also compute confidence intervals or approximate confidence intervals and so on. And this is pretty nice. I don't want to do this here in this uh, elementary um, section, yeah, but this would, would enable us. Yeah. I, um, be a little bit careful here. This is more or less a theoretical situation. We nearly never in practice have that dedicated test set. So you'll have to use resampling and we'll talk about this on the next slide. Um, and a little extra, um, I don't know, hint or common. So this Gaussian approximation, I mean, we have the central limit theorem um, and that tells us that we can yeah, kind of do this approximation in general, but it will work less well if we're using something like um, you know, binary variables like the zero one loss or, or bi binary objects like the 
uh, resulting from the zero one, one loss, then these LIs here, uh, these guys will um, be exactly zero or one. And if their mean value um, is pretty close to zero, then um, yeah, this approximation might not be the best thing ever. And in these cases, we can do you know, special approximations. So for, um, for zero one, we might use a binomial, maybe um, a true, um, true distribution um, of the estimator. Uh, and we can also do that for other loss functions, but this is cumbersome, right? Because we have to do this special approach then for each and individual um, loss function. So in, in general, yeah, this, uh, the CLT approach um, works, works quite well. Yeah, we have to be a little bit careful in some of these corner cases. What I actually now want to analyze is the um, bias and variance of our resampling estimator, which is much more realistic that we're going to use one of these guys in practice. So in this case, I now have to estimate um, this theoretical property here. So the generalization error of my inducing algorithm when I'm applying that to n samples and n would be the size of my complete available data set. And remember that we're using that as a surrogate for what we're actually interested in, this generalization error of our model f hat. And um, when f hat is built on our full D, where n is the sample size again. But also remember that this is um, hmm, uh, somewhat impossible to practically calculate because if we are fitting f hat on the full data set, then no data is left for testing. So we rather have to use resampling, rather consider the, the inducer here. So we are running our learning algorithm again, and we have to run it on, on less data than the full n, so on smaller training sets. So here I have simply um, now repeated the definition of our generalization error estimator based on resampling. So we produce a bunch of training test splits. Uh, so these, these yacht train, yacht test guys. Uh, so our training set here and our testing set here, we predict, we train on the training set, we predict on the testing set, we compute our um, scalar performance metric value rho, and then we aggregate them somehow at the end. And I want to now simplify this very ugly formula here a little bit so we can handle it a bit better. So first of all, let's the way very and all of these realistic assumptions and um, simplifications I'm going to make up are rather rather realistic. So first of all, I'm going to assume that my aggregation function is the average and that my rho function is actually loss based and not something weird. Um, I don't know, like AOC or whatever. So um, yeah, so the whole formula becomes a bit more manageable. And this this estimator here, one of these estimators is nothing more than a well trained test set holdout estimator. And in a certain sense, we studied this before. Yeah, we called this dedicated test set. And I don't know from the from the setup, it's a bit, little bit different. But in terms of the analysis, not maybe not really. Anyway, so the important point is that I, I now want to do a bias variance analysis of this. And first of first, I want to start with the bias analysis. So I want to compute the expectation of this guy. So how do I do that? So first of all, I said that this aggregator here should be the average function. Yeah. So I have a sum going on, which looks like this. And then the the these raw guys here on the inside, they will all be roughly the same. So this is why I'm now putting here this um, approx. Uh, um, the, I mean, they are using random training sets and random test sets and they are all the same random vectors that I'm producing there. So there's no problem of treating all of these guys the same because they, they will all be identically distributed, except for one minor problem. And this is if I'm unlucky um, for my data set at hand uh, or for my, for my specific resampling strategy, they are not necessarily of exactly the same size. So the, the training and the test sets might be slightly different. And I'm going to kind of um, forget about that here. I'm assuming they will be exactly the same. Uh, so in, in general, this might only hold approximately with a very tiny deviation. And um, if they are the same, if they are of exactly, if they are of exactly the same size, I can put an equal sign here. And that because then they all of this will be identically distributed. And, um, so I'm now computing the expectation of one of these guys here. And I can do that yeah, I'm, I'm, because I'm simply averaging here and because of um, the linearity of the expectation operator. And here another technical comment, but we've I've now made this comment multiple times for these generalization error of the learning algorithm. So if I'm looking at that guy, I have now two random variables to worry about. I have the training set, detrain, and I have my test set. So my, my actually, this should be, sorry, this actually typo, this should be x, y from the test set. So both of these guys are random and I'm taking the expectation over both of them. But we did that before in the definition. So it might be also a good idea to reconsider um, the, the section on the definition and introduction of the generalization error. Um, 
Okay, so, so far, so good. So let's now continue with this. So I've copied over our formula here. So this is still the same. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drive the expectation further inside of that. Well, before I'm doing that, I'm now substituting my rho here and just writing it out as the loss the, with the loss function yeah, because I assume that this would be defined in terms of you know, a loss function L. If it's defined in terms of a loss function L, um, this guy here yeah, is, is fairly simple and we now really understand this form very well. So we have our training data set. On the training data set, we run our inducing algorithm. This gives us the model F hat for, for one of these training sets. And in this model F hat, um, we now insert our test observations yeah, from the test set. We iterate over them, we insert them here, we compute the loss for, for each uh, individual uh, observation by comparing to the, to the true label Y and then we average again over everything. So there's another operation of averaging going on. And yeah, I have this expectation now again outside of this averaging operation. So we again do the same thing, put this on the inside for this fixed training set. Again, the stuff here will be IID. I don't even need the independence for the expectation, yeah, but uh, I guess I need the identically distributed uh, property. So I draw this to the inside. And if I do that, what is left there is expect, well, maybe this should actually be on the slide. I have expected value of uh, the, this averaging and the sum this, this all kind of goes away. I don't need this anymore because this will be always all be the same guys yeah, that I'm averaging over. The expected value of a loss when I take a fresh test sample x, y, and I have a independent training set, d train. Again, this is very hard to write and I should probably do this differently. Sorry about that. So this is what now comes out of this. Maybe I can do brackets like this here. But this is exactly our definition of our generalization error for an inducer. And this is why I put the reference to the training set size here, because you can see now, these are the training set sizes. Yeah, these D trains, they all come from resampling, yeah, from my resampling split, splits. So they will be smaller than N. Yeah? They will have N train elements in them. So um, when we now estimate um, this guy here, so our generalization error with reference to N samples through the resampling estimator, the expectation of this guy is actually this guy here, which is nearly what we want, except for the sample size used in training the models. Yeah. So we're using N train samples to fit our models and not exactly N. And this is exactly the reason why we say this is pessimistically biased, yeah, because in expectation, this will be a little bit worse than what we want to estimate because we're using less samples in training our models, which will result in models which have a little bit worse performance yeah, because they have use less examples in training. And the bias will be the stronger, the smaller our training um, splits become in resampling. Yeah? So that's our choice, how we construct that. The next thing I want to discuss a little bit is how independent these results are. So that is now kind of a variance analysis of, um, of resampling. And here I mainly want to focus on cross validation. So first of all, for many of the things I've said before, specifically for this, this, this empirical analysis here. I could have also done this for cross validation and would have seen very, very uh, similar results um, qualitatively uh, and I would have come to the same conclusions. What I want to talk a little bit about here is the conclusion for this because also this is the same, but I want to kind of discuss this a little bit. One problem here is that we might now be tempted to do the following. So if we run cross validation, right, and we do this with, I don't know, 10 or 20 folds. So this would be a vector of performance values over the folds. So we have maybe, I don't know, maybe we have 20 folds. So we have a um, performance value, I don't know, CV1 here from the first training test split. And yeah, I have, I have 20 of these guys, uh, CV, CV20 here. And I can put them into a nice little vector and take a look at them. And what I usually do is I compute the mean of this and say, this, well, this is my estimator. Uh, of my, my cross validation estimator of generalization performance. Now, we might also be tempted to report the vector, um, to report its standard uh, deviation specifically, or to plot this through a density plot, and then, um, I don't know, in our head, perform something like a normal um, approximation, and then maybe start you know, doing this for another learning algorithm, and then comparing the two, and now we are pretty much immediately at confidence interval estimation and performing um, null hypothesis uh, significance tests. And this is actually not really um, okay, because for all of that stuff to work, we would either have to have something like a, a well-behaved 
estimator of the standard deviation of this now, of this vector, uh, or these samples being IID, uh, so also independent. And both of these things, well, they are tightly connected and they are unfortunately not really possible or at least not possible in a naive manner. Uh, so we, what we specifically cannot do is we cannot simply compute um, the standard deviation of this guy uh, and, and assume independence and then put this into a t-test uh, or something like this. So I now have pretty much done here what you shouldn't really do in teaching. So I've put on the slide what you sh shouldn't do, right? So I could plot these two guys here as density plots. I'm allowed to do that. Problem comes with the next step, whether I'm going to perform now a t-test either in my head uh, based on the standard deviation or whether I'm really formally um, running a t-test and did that here as well. Uh, and of course that produces a result and this, uh, in this case, it would be significant. It, it might still be significant re in reality, but formally what I'm doing here is, is wrong uh, because my um, assumption for the t-test that these guys are independent, these samples that I'm pushing inside of the t-test, this is not given, this is not true. I want to now shed a little bit of light of why they are not independent. What I will not do here in this section is tell you what you can do in, uh, instead. So there are adapted tests um, that you can run instead, but the whole discussion is, is fairly complicated and uh, yeah, far from trivial and I don't, don't want to do this here in this introductory section. Maybe I'm going to add that later on to the lecture. So the problem is that if we would run a variance analysis of our GE head estimator for cross validation. So what we would like to have, so we did that here for the dedicated test set. Yeah. So, well, this is not exactly the same, but for the dedicated test set, what we kind of saw is that this is a really simple, I don't know, one over N variance reduction. Yeah. And well, here we were going over variances uh, of individual observations uh, to put together the variance of that guy. And we would like to see something similar here in resampling that if we go over the variance of that guy, this is a simple combination of the variance of a, yeah, of the individual holdout estimator that we're using on the inside of, of, of resampling. But this is actually not the case. So the variance of this guy is actually quite difficult combination of the average variance uh, when, because we estimate on finite uh, training test sets, on, 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 on finite training sets. The covariance from, from test errors, yeah, because our models actually result from overlapping training sets. So if we I look at my cross validation, uh, let's maybe do a threefold. I'm going to fit my models now, for example, on this guy here and this guy. And the next model I'm going to fit on this guy and this guy. Yeah? So these training sets actually overlap and that makes our test errors that we produce in cross validation correlated. And then I have another covariance component which comes from the dependence of training sets. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the same as this year, but also because test observations appear in, tres, in, in training sets. Yeah? So this, this test, test set here now appears in this guy. Yeah? So I guess we could say all of this comes from these overlaps. Um, and this means that if we naively now compute the empirical variance of the K individual performance estimators from, from cross validation, as I did on the slide before, yeah, so if I just compute here the empirical standard deviation from this vector, um, then this will be a biased estimator of the true variance. And in general, it will underestimate the true variance. And this is bad because that means we are going to perform rejections here on this then wrongly applied t-test more often than we would like. Um, yeah, and it's actually worse. So it's not only wrong that we're doing that if, if we are using that naive approach, we can actually show, uh, and there's a very um, well-known paper that shows this here, what I've, what I've, which I've referenced here, that there is no unbiased estimator of the variance of, of cross-validation. Uh, so we can't easily produce one. If, and this we somehow have to take into account when, when we want to compare learners by um, um, significance tests or by confidence intervals, which is certainly a I don't know, worthwhile endeavor and, and something we should probably do because I mean, their performance values are stochastic. So we have to take that, um, take that randomness into account when we compare stuff. So just comparing by mean values is probably also not good and completely forgetting about stochasticity and, and randomness. Um, but it's quite hard to get that right in practice. Um, it's a somewhat difficult topic and I'll, I'll want to leave it here at the warning. And if you want to, if you want to look more deeply into this, either, I don't know, wait for a year and till I've included it here in the lecture or um, yeah, Google for some papers that um, um, produce um, adapted tests. Uh, so there are, for example, adapted t-tests specifically produced for cross-validation. Um, I want to wrap up and finish here with a short guideline. 
um, how to maybe approach this in practice. So the first thing you could kind of consider is that for some model classes, there are actually fast tricks to compute leave one out. If that exists, you might be interested in running something like this because that, that can save you a lot of time. Um, very many people don't do this because not for all model classes that exists. Um, and um, you can maybe use this as a trick in, in, in some model selection and tuning approaches on the inside of tuning. If you have a large sample, yeah, then maybe doing something like um, normal holdout is okay um, if this is really large. Yeah? But if, this, if your sample is quite small or only medium size, then I, I would actually not use um, simple holdout or cross relation with few folds or subsampling with small split rates. I guess there's never a reason to do that because that can really bias your estimator and have a quite large variance and we discussed the reasons for this now, I would say quite in detail. Um, for data sets of medium size, uh, five fold cross relation or 10 fold cross relation have really become standard. For small sample sizes, everything is still um, difficult. So you could use leave one out, but I warned a little bit against that. Um, probably better idea to use something like um, 10 times repeated 10 fold cross validation, or I don't know, 20 times repeated cross validation with 20 folds. That's um, state of the art for small sample sizes. I also warned against or warned about that if um, data sets have really large sample size and we might inclined to run simple holdout uh, in order to save computation time, which is also a worthwhile perspective. Yeah? Stuff becomes fairly expensive if we repeat stuff uh, like in resampling that these data sets can actually have hidden small sample size properties because for example, it's very imbalanced and one class is very small or one subgroup is very small. So you have to watch out for that. If you know what you're doing, um, um, you can get away with, with things being faster here, but you should think about these hidden small sample size properly. So think about subgroups. I guess that's the first thing I would do. Are there interesting subgroups, especially with respect to the labels, but maybe also with respect to some input input features and you know, also study the variance of your estimator. You can repeat things and, and, and look at that empirically and, and hopefully see, if you see a large variance, I guess you should go back to the, I don't know, design stage of your evaluation workflow and, and, and reconsider things. And as a final comment, subsampling is usually better than bootstrapping. So the repeated observations that can cause problems in training, especially if we do that in, in nested resampling as in tuning. And But I've warned against that already in um, the first part of um, the lecture here. And then there's other stuff really made for small sample sizes like um, the B632 plus from Efron. Yeah, didn't discuss this here, but that's also available. But that's usually only a good choice for models of somewhat lowish complexity because you need to estimate the overfitting, the overfitting strength of your inducing algorithm. And that's that's also not 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 that simple. Okay, I'll leave it at here. Um, this concludes this section.